What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is Tom Wheeler, the former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission and the author of the recently published book, Tech Lash, Who Makes the Rules in the Digital Gilded Age? Tom and I spend the first hour of our conversation discussing his time leading the FCC, what he learned during his time there about the policymaking process and the challenges of regulating big tech, why industrial era regulations and agencies are ill-suited for overseeing today's 21st century digital economy, and what's at stake if we don't get it right. In the second hour of our conversation, Tom and I get into specific policy and regulatory proposals for dealing with both social media and artificial intelligence by challenging some of the false dichotomies and tribal biases that have dominated this conversation in recent years. We look at ways of incentivizing social media platforms to produce better quality information that cuts across political and ideological lines and that reduces the incidence of costly externalities like rising rates of anxiety and depression among children. We also discuss President Joe Biden's recently signed executive order on AI and the challenges of regulating this profoundly disruptive and potentially dangerous new technology. You can access that part of the conversation on our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe, where you can also join in on the conversation by becoming a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners. And with that, please enjoy this deeply informative and timely conversation with my guest, Tom Wheeler. Tom Wheeler, welcome to Hidden Forces. Hello, Dimitri. Great to be with you. It's great to have you on, Tom. So um, I'm very excited for this conversation. One, I'm excited because I read your book and I really enjoyed it. And I told you before we started the recording that I've been looking for resources like this, and I haven't been able to find too many and too many people to speak to. And when I say resources like this, I mean people or resources that deal with the regulatory challenges of these new technologies that are very disruptive to society and how to manage the benefits that accrue to the private sector with the public interest, something that it feels like people don't really know how to talk about much anymore, this idea of the public interest. What is it? What are the interests of us as citizens as opposed to just simply consumers, which I feel like people have become very accustomed to thinking about? Before we do that, I would love for you to talk to us a little bit about the arc of your career. Because when I started looking into your background, I assumed that you started working in the private sector, in the telecommunications and internet space. But in fact, it looks like you got your start actually working as a representative of big business beginning and actually in the grocery industry. So tell me a little bit about like how your career progressed and, and what led you to, to becoming ultimately the chairman of the FCC. Well, I, I am a proud graduate of The Ohio State University, and I was in graduate school there and got involved in the 1968 Senate campaign of Jack Gilligan, who was one of the authors of the Minority Peace Plank at the 1968 Democratic Convention. And unfortunately, Jack lost, but fortunately, another friend of his in Washington, a great man by the name of George Cook, K-O-C-H, who was at that point in time running the Grocery Manufacturers of America. And I always wanted to come to Washington. And he said, hey, can you help Tom get a job in Congress? Because that was really where I wanted to end up as a staffer. And instead, he hired me. And so I spent the next seven years there, which was a fabulous postgraduate education, and then was hired by the nascent cable television business. It was then, it wasn't even cable TV, it was CATV, Community Antenna Television, to be the number two in their trade association, the National Cable Television Association. And a couple of years later, I ended up being the number one, and it was the great era in cable. It was the dawn of ESPN, MTV, HBO, CNN, all the wonderful things that we know about cable TV right now. But at that point in time, they were fighting for existence. 
because the broadcasters didn't like the competition. Hollywood didn't like the fact that there was a new system being set up. And so there were all kinds of federal regulations from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in particular, that were holding cable back. And so we fought those fights and I went out into the business. And, you know, there was, this was now 1985 and everybody was starting to talk about home computers. And so I was the CEO of the first delivery of high-speed data on cable television lines to home computers. It was called NABU, N-A-B-U, the Home Computer Network. There was a small problem with the business plan, however. In 1985, there weren't that many home computers. <laughs> and the technology worked, but the market wasn't ready for it. I went on and did several other things in digital video, starting a couple other companies. And then had the incredible good fortune to be part of a group that won an FCC license for this new thing called cellular phones. And at that point in time, the FCC was awarding cellular licenses by lottery. It is the dumbest way possible to, to decide who gets a license to this incredibly valuable spectrum. But it was the way that it was being run. And my group's ball, literally, or balls uh, came up in the lottery. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was learning about wireless. That then led to I was asked to come in and take over as the CEO of the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association. And I was there for all the great developments in cellular. When I came in, it was just coming off 1G to 2G. We went through 3G, 4G, and I was there for about a dozen years and then went out and became a partner in a venture capital firm investing in the kinds of companies that were developing this new digital technology. And then uh, one day I got a telephone call uh, at home and the president is interested in you being chairman of the FCC and uh, life changed. So that was President Obama and that would have been his second administration, right? Because you were head Correct. of the FCC from 2013 to 2017. Correct. What was the reason, because I don't know the backstory here, why did he choose a different FCC chairman halfway through his administration? Did the person retire or was there was there a desire to change policy direction? Like, What's the sort of backstory to that? So my predecessor was Julius Denikowski, wonderful guy, good friend, and it's a taxing job. And it's kind of typical that after four years, you move on. Hmm. So what would you say you're best known for during your time as FCC chairman? What are you proudest of in terms of your accomplishments? Well, I think there are multiple things. First of all, obviously, the one that always comes to mind is net neutrality. And we finally were able to pass net neutrality rules and have them sustained by the court. You know, something had been going on for a dozen years over multiple Republican and Democratic administrations, and we finally got it done. But also the uh, privacy rules that we put in place to protect consumers' privacy when they were online and cybersecurity. You know, I came in and it was amazing. Here, every single cyber attack at some point in time comes across a private network. And here was the FCC responsible for the regulation of those networks. And what were we doing to make sure that they were secure? So we did a lot of things in cybersecurity. And then I'm also terribly proud of the fact that when we came in, only 30% of America's schools and libraries were connected to high-speed internet connections, essentially fiber. And only half of those had a high-speed connection to the student's desk with Wi-Fi. And when we left, over 95% of all the school buildings in America had high-speed Wi-Fi to the student's desk because of the mm. overhaul that we did in a federal program supporting those efforts. So when you were, I was looking into this and when you, the first year that you were at the FCC, you worked on and uh, proposed a r rule changes that would create so-called internet fast lanes that would allow companies to pay ISPs to, in order to get faster service. I don't know if you would call that prioritization of data packets, but basically there would be some way for companies like Netflix to be able to get faster service. You ended up applying Title II, 
to of the Communications Act of 1934 to the internet in your second year. And this is part of what you're talking about in terms of like net neutrality. Did your position on this issue change? And if so, why? So my position in terms of the importance of open networks never changed. I mean, remember that back in my career, I was trying to get access onto networks and understood that experience. What changed what was what was the best way to do it? Because I was in office for probably three or four months when one Tuesday morning, the general counsel walks in and says, well, the Court of Appeals has just handed down a verdict that rejected my predecessor's mm. attempt to have open internet rules, net neutrality. And it then became our problem. And as I read that opinion, it looked to me as though the court, and this was like the third or fourth time that the court had turned down the rules saying to the FCC, you're doing it the wrong way. And so as I read that opinion, it looked as though the court was pointing at a solution. And so I started down the path that was a long way of discussing it called Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act, not the Communications Act, the Telecommunications Act. And so we started down that road and I became very aware. I mean, it, it was a very much of a learning process and it became very obvious that the test of under Section 706 was, is it commercially viable? And that was something that hadn't been tested in the court. It was the Communications Act of 96. There hadn't been that many. And what is commercial of it? Is it, is it viable to the company or is it commercially viable and available to consumers? How do you interpret that? The Communications Act written in 1934, which is one of the struggles of running an analog agency in a digital era is that you're trying to interpret things that weren't even imagined when the statute was written. But the Communications Act of 34 had a well-established under common carriage Title II comment concept of just and reasonable. And so access had to be just and reasonable. So this was a learning experience for me. There was lots of tension. I mean, oh my goodness, you know. But it was a, a process. The president who had originally been skeptical of Title II himself came around to Title II. And so that ended up being what we enacted. And for the first time in history, that action withstood court challenge. And it stood as law until the Trump administration came in and at the request of the networks repealed it. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about that too. I, I have to say, as someone who hasn't worked in government, I'm fascinated and I cannot help but believe that I underappreciate the extent to which different interest groups need to be satisfied in order to achieve some objective of the government. And I think that a lot of times people from the outside look at an issue, they feel unsatisfied with the result, and they don't realize just how many forces are interacting in order to try to get to some kind of viable solution, which is something I do want to talk to you about later when we talk about potential regulatory approaches to both social media and AI. I realized that we didn't actually define what net neutrality is. So why don't you do that really quick for our listeners? Net neutrality is deprioritization. It is first come, first serve, non-discriminatory access to the network. And it's not a new idea. It is an idea literally that goes back to when England was coming out of the feudal era. And for the first time, English common law developed. And during the feudal era, the guy who was running the ferry across the river was under the command and control of the local lord. As things began to come out of that kind of era, a concept of common law came about. It's called common law because it was now common in all the courts across the country rather than just the local potentate being the one who made the rules. And that was a, a duty to deal. If you were the ferryman, you had a duty to carry everybody. If you were an innkeeper, 
you had the duty to shelter everybody. If you were providing food, you had the duty to feed everybody. Not for free, but you had an obligation. It was a concept that then got well developed in common law. And when telecommunications began to develop in this country, the 1860. Two, I believe it was Pacific Telegraph Act, which paid for, obviously, the Pacific Telegraph, stipulated non-discriminatory access to that essential network. That idea was then adopted for the telephone companies as telephone telephony came in. And, you know, we wouldn't have had the Internet in the early days if there hadn't been non-discriminatory access, because you, you remember the screeching modems that you used to hook your computer mm. up to that plugged into the telephone jack that took your digital information coming out of your computer, turned it into analog sounds that mm-hmm. could be carried by the sound-carrying telephone network and then decoded it at the other end. If the telephone companies hadn't been required to carry those transmissions, we never would have had, you know, AOL and Prodigy and all of the other things that led us to the Internet. And so the whole concept then became, okay, how do we make sure that this tradition of non-discriminatory access is available on broadband networks? And as I say, it's something that had been going on through Republican and Democratic FCCs for over a decade and had constantly been thrown out by the courts saying, you're not doing it the right way. So I came in a proponent of this historical pattern. And the question was, how do you best accomplish it? And I finally came to the conclusion that Title II was the best way to accomplish it. What act was it that required or set of regulations or statutes that required ISPs at the time in the 1990s to carry that traffic indiscriminately? There wasn't. But they were just doing it out of just out of Oh, cost. I'm sorry. I'm IS what are you saying? ISPs. You're saying you ISPs, mean, yeah, inter service I was providers. ISP versus or, telephone company. You're talking about the, the telephone company oh, in the God, early okay. days right, of the Right, 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 because we were using telephony right. to convey the signal, right? Right. So, they were they were Title II common carriers. Title II they had common to provide, carriers, right. They had so, to provide got it, got it. non-discriminatory yeah. access. Okay, fascinating. So, yeah, I wanted to also define net neutrality because I feel like conceptually you could think of it in a way that goes beyond simply the physical movement of traffic across the network to thinking about the movement of information on the software layer. And now you have a lot of these bottlenecks, like these large platforms that are discriminatory in terms, and they have to be in some sense because they're actually moderating and making decisions about what to amplify, what not to amplify, which gets into a question about like how, in your view, when when you think about net neutrality, is it broader than the physical information that's traversing the network in your view? And is it something that should apply to the software platforms as well that have become, in the evolution of the internet, gatekeepers in a way that didn't really exist in the early 2000s when the term net neutrality was first coined? What a great question, Dimitri. Those who are opposing net neutrality, again, let's go back and review the bidding here that we put it in place in 2015 when the Trump administration came in in 2017, they eliminated it. And now the Biden FCC has a proposal to put it back in place. And once again, those who would be regulated by it are outraged and they're making all of these arguments about, oh, we've been very good. We haven't, we haven't prioritized. We haven't caused problems. And the difficulty is that, uh, and I wrote a piece recently for the Brookings Institution in which I said, yes, the concept of not blocking or not throttling traffic is important, but it's not the most important concept in net neutrality, Title II net neutrality. We put in a thing called the general conduct rule. And the general conduct rule was a part of this rulemaking said that for everything that an internet service provider does, it has to pass the smell test. Is it just and reasonable? And that what you don't want to do is define tomorrow in terms of what you know are the issues today. Rather, you've got to create some agility 
in regulatory oversight that allows you to anticipate things that you know are coming, but you can't define at this moment. And so we put the general conduct rule into net neutrality. It is in the new Biden FCC proposal for net neutrality. And I think it is the most important part of net neutrality because it says going forward, what you do has to pass the smell test of is this just and reasonable? And, you know, if anything ever proved that as a regulatory concept, it's AI. Mm -hmm. If anything ever proved that as a regulatory concept, it's what's going on on the Internet today. And the challenge of regulatory bodies today is how do they have the kind of agility to deal with the new changes that are being brought forth by new technology. So I have a few more questions about existing regulations and statutes before we get into a conversation about the book, just so I kind of lay a good foundation here. So one of the criticisms leveled against the use of Title II is that it's not appropriate for achieving the principle of net neutrality, and that the only reason that we've relied on it is that previous attempts to regulate internet service providers as if they were utilities under other provisions of the Communications Act were thwarted. Do you agree with that view that this was the best you guys could achieve, but that it, it wasn't ideal for that solution? Well, first of all, it's not utility regulation. I mean, okay. what's utility? Utility regulation is your gas company, your water company, you know, that that you have to have water. Therefore, we are going to grant monopoly and we will oversee that closely. Those who were opposed to net neutrality kept trying to characterize it as utility regulation that will thwart innovation and investment. But that is a false characterization. The reason why you need net neutrality goes back as I, the history I, I laid out. And it was the same reason we needed openness on the telegraph, the same reason we need openness on the telephone that allowed the internet to develop in the first place, is that if you have an essential network, then you need to make sure that there is open access to that network. As a matter of fact, we renamed Everybody calls it net neutrality, but we renamed it the open internet order because that's really what we were talking about. How do you make these platforms open so that they can provide opportunities to reach, for everyone to reach everyone and everyone to receive everyone? So one more question. So Title II is something that comes up a lot. And another thing that people hear a lot is Section 230 of Title 47 of the United States Code that was enacted as part of the right. Communications Decency Act of 1996. Right. Why does this part of this act keep coming up in public conversation around tech platforms and in particular social media platforms and regulation? What is the relevance of it in your view? Well, you got to go back to the history here that in 1996, Congress was amending the Communications Act and they were confronted with an amendment that was led by Senator Jim Exon from Nebraska, where he was concerned about the decency of what's online. And a couple of congressmen, Ron Wyden of Oregon and Crix Cox of Colorado, Wyden is now a senator, amended that to provide two things. One, that in what's called Section 230C2, that internet service providers could not be held liable for making editorial judgments. In other words, I'm not going to carry this Nazi propaganda, but I won't be liable for making that decision. But 230C2 precedes it and says that it has been interpreted by the courts as saying that there is essentially a blanket exemption from the internet platforms, not the networks, the platforms who use the network. There is a, a blanket protection from liability there so that what happened was the platforms end up relying on C1 
rather than C2. And oh, by the way, immediately after passage, the Section 230 was taken to court. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the provisions that triggered it in the first place about obscenity online were thrown out as a violation of the First Amendment. So we're left with 230C1 and C2 that are part of this infamous Title II that we have been talking about. And the Trump administration wanted the Trump FCC to become specifically the president, called this out, wanted the Trump FCC to become the arbiter of what is on social media platforms in particular by focusing on the fact that the exemptions are based on a good faith decision. And the general counsel of the Trump FCC came in and said, yes, this is something that the agency can do. And uh, fortunately, we had a, uh, a national election that, that changed that. So the Trump administration overturned your 2015 order that allowed the FCC to regulate internet service providers as common carriers. How do you feel about that decision? <laughs> I I think it's awful. You know, I mean, the thing I like, uh, not like, yeah. And also, what I, are the and also what are the implications of that? Well, the implications are. It goes back to what I was saying before about the most important part of it is the general conduct rule and how you have in place the ability to determine whether or not these essential networks are acting in a just and reasonable nature. The networks themselves are trying to define it with a head fake, if you will, saying, oh no, it's only about blocking and throttling. By the way, it used to be about blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization. Hmm. And you know, you will pay to prioritize my packets. Well, that's suddenly dropped off of the opponent's screen. But the point here is that what is important is that, well, I, I, I know where I was going now. I was talking to talk about the court decision in which, so we passed net neutrality, open internet, and it was repealed by the Trump FCC. That was then appealed by pro open internet folks. And it went back to the same court that had affirmed our previous decision. And there is in the law a concept called Chevron deference, which goes back to an old court case about Natural Resources Council versus Chevron, in which the Supreme Court said, hey, you know, we have expert agencies for a reason. We ought to rely on their expertise to interpret statutes. We won our court case because the court said the FCC has Chevron deference to make the decision that these are common carriers. A couple of years later, the same court made the decision that the FCC had Chevron deference to say, no, they're not. Despite the fact that one of my favorite, it, well, the opinion of, of one of the judges was that Despite its apparent unconnectedness to reality, the decision must stand as a result of Chevron deference. And so, you know, I think it's important that we understand the broad importance of Title II, the broad importance of the general conduct rule and not get sucked into the head fake of those who say, well, it's only about uh, blocking and throttling of content. So I want to make sure we get into the book, which is really the primary reason I brought you on here today to talk about not just what you write in the book, but also how to regulate some of these emerging technologies, technologies also that have been around like social media and AI. But I'm glad that we had this conversation just now because I think these understanding the sort of existing regulatory foundation is important and we're going to we're going to reference back to it. So your book well, is let me titled- be more specific about that if I can for a second. Sure, yeah. Dimitri. Okay. So one of the reasons that I wrote TechLash is because of my experience 
trying to operate an analog-based agency in a digital era mm. and understanding what the difficulties of that were. Mm. And we've just spent the last, what, 20 minutes talking about those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Yeah, no, I love reality. that. That's a really great point. And that's another big part of the book, which is how should regulators evolve in order to regulate an industry for which they weren't originally designed right. from an industrial era to a digital era. So your book is titled Tech Lash, as you said. The subtitle is Who Makes the Rules in the Digital Gilded Age? And you have here, I should say, I've never read a book that's been positively reviewed by Ken Burns, the famous documentary filmmaker, so congratulations. Why did you choose this subtitle, Who Makes the Rules in the Digital Gilded Age? Why the Gilded Age and why is that an appropriate reference point for what you wrote about? Well, so during the day, I mess around with technology policy, but my evocation is I'm a, I'm a frustrated history buff. Hmm. And so I kept looking at the experiences that we're having today, and I kept seeing the Gilded Age in that. Let's go back for a second and, and understand what we're talking about. The period from about 1870 to the early 20th century the early industrialization. The populist and progressive eras. Populist and progressive era. That Mark Twain co-authored a book called The Gilded Age. And that name stuck to the era because it was kind of a, it was a book that mocked, if you will. You can watch on HBO now, The Gilded Age in season two and see some of the realities. And, and you know, what is to gild? What is something that is gilded? It is painted over with gold, painting over with gold, something that is not valuable to make it look like it in fact is valuable gold. And in a, a level of unreality, in reality, if you will. And so I looked at the era of the original Gilded Age and I looked at today and here's the list of things that I saw that were common. First of all, you had new technologies driving change, that they were resulting in new economic models, new products, low prices. They were accelerating the pace of life. They were destroying small businesses. They were creating monopolies. There was huge wealth disparity. There was consumer harm, and there was even fake news in the original Gilded Age because you had Pulitzer and Hearst and yellow journalism. And I looked at that, and I said, my goodness, sound familiar? <laughs> and then there's another great Twain quote in which he says, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it oftentimes rhymes. And so I thought that there were rhymes between the original Gilded Age of the Industrial Era and the new Gilded Age of the Digital Era. And so the first part of the book talks about hmm. what are those parallels. And then the second part of TechLash talks about here's some ideas for how we can deal with it. Because what happened in the original Gilded Age was eventually... We the people got together, you referenced a minute ago, the progressive movement and the populist movement, got together and said, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And I, I hope we're approaching that kind of point now. Hmm. So no, I, I do want to talk about that. In that subtitle, besides the reference to the digital gilded age, it also starts with who makes the rules? Who makes right. the rules in the digital right. gilded age? Who makes the rules today? The rules have always been made by the innovators and their investors in these two eras. I mean, and we want that. I mean, it's terrific. I mean, the progress in science, business, art, always came from people saying, well, I know this is the way it has been done, but I'm going to take another approach and, and see where that leads. And they make the rules for that new era because only they can see the future. What happened in the original Gilded Age was that the innovators and their investors made the rules, 
until it got to a point where they were infringing on the rights of individuals and the public interest, at which time policies were put in place, guardrails were put in place to overcome um, some of the inherent excesses of the process. And we haven't reached that point yet. I hope we do soon. But that's the history that the original Gilded Age had guardrails put in place. And after those guardrails were put in place, my goodness, capitalism still flourished. Investment still happened. Innovation went wild. We built the world's strongest economy that took us through two wars. And we can do the same here. Yeah, I actually, uh, I love one of the analogies that you draw in the book between, I think it was the pollution emitted by the smokestacks on the locomotives as they moved across the plains. Right. And the pollution that is occurring in the public domain and the public mind as a result of social media. I think that's a really great, actually, analogy because people are able to intuitively understand the idea that companies competing with each other that are incentivized to pollute the local estuaries need to be regulated to prevent that because it's in the public interest. But somehow the consequences, the negative disruptive consequences that result from how, and I'm going to, again, use specifically social media because it was initially the reason that I asked you on, though the recent executive order on artificial intelligence and some of the rapid advancements that we've seen there, I think is also somewhere where I want to take this conversation. But there are so many ills that stem from the way in which social media companies run their businesses that people can agree on irrespective of where they are along the political spectrum. Everyone has children. Everyone sees that there have been negative effects to kids that can be ascribed to social media. Again, it's very difficult to draw a causal arrow here. We talk about anxiety, depression, but there's a strong consensus view that social media has something to do with it. Social media also has something to do with the elevated levels of discord. Where I find there's a huge disconnect, and this is something I'd also love to try to address here, and it's been a struggle for me on this show to kind of talk about it. The disconnect is between people on the new sort of emerging right, which has both elements of the traditional left and the right, and people on the sort of progressive left who I think see themselves more as the kind of ruling establishment, see their views and cultural affinities and ideals and values reflected in the institutions of the day. Those people on the left feel like the current governance model of social media, at least up until I guess Elon took over Twitter, has been largely reflective of their concerns. They aren't necessarily concerned about intelligence agencies interfering in the moderation process on social media because I guess in their view, again, I'm I'm uh, sort of generalizing here, but the the general view I think on the left is that it's not a it's not their biggest concern because so long as they're you know taking down quote hate speech or taking down fake news etc they're okay with it the right is highly suspicious because they interpret all of this activity as censoring and censoring with a political bent i think that there's a way to bridge this divide through regulation but again it's kind of why i brought you on here i feel like i got sidetracked i was talking about externalities right sorry long long soliloquy here um Let's just talk about this for a second. First of all, do you feel free to elaborate on the analogy that you put forward in the book between pollution in the industrial era and the sort of digital pollution that I'm talking about here? And what role do you think regulation can play here in a way that, and how do we communicate the role that regulation could play in a way that people on both sides of political spectrum can actually feel like is in their best interests? Well, you know, Dimitri, one of the other concepts that came out of that development of common law hundreds of years ago that we were talking about was the concept of a duty of care. And the reference that you make about locomotives in the original Gilded Age, the story is that the government would use its power to grant railroads, the first high-speed network, by the way, to grant railroads access to farmers' property, and they would cut across the property, and the smokestacks would throw off hot cinders that would set 
hayricks and barns and houses afire. And so that ended up in court, and the courts said, wait a minute, there's a duty of care here. What is the duty of care? The duty of care is when you are offering a product or a service, you have a responsibility to anticipate what are potential harms and mitigate them. It's the basis of negligence in the law and, a, and a ne the tort of negligence. And so these railroad companies were negligent for not obeying their duty of care, were found guilty. And so what'd they do? They put a screen across the top of the smokestack, <laughs> right? It captured the hot cinders. And so the point that I was making in TechLash is where is the duty of care mm. in the digital platform world? Who is thinking about what kind of screen you should put across this to make sure that it controls for adverse effects? And let me just go back to your soliloquy for a, a second, because it was very thoughtful. But I think it also misses the point that if we argue this issue from the left saying everybody has to get on, the right saying you can't have any censorship or any, any curatorial responsibility, that mispositions the issue and allows the discussion to happen at the edges of the political spectrum rather than asking the central question, which is what is the responsibility of those who are putting out this in the first place? And how are they exercising their duty of care? And, um, and that's one, you know, I mean, this morning I woke up, I'm shaving and I'm listening to Morning Joe like I always do. And there is a commercial from Meta, the former Facebook, with their product Instagram, in which they're saying, well, you know, these harms to children, this is really up to Congress to solve. Excuse me? <laughs> I mean, let's step up and where is the responsibility and where is the expectation of responsibility for these platform companies? And so that's one of the major themes in TechLash. And I try and describe a potential regulatory structure that could deal with that. No, so I'm, I actually agree with you. The reason I highlight the political divide, though, is because I feel like there's a fundamental miscommunication here. The, the way that this subject is being talked about and the way in which regulation of social media, let's just stay on this because we're going to talk about AI as well in the larger sort of tech community, but the way in which social media regulation is talked about, I think is just completely wrong. It's talked about as though people that are on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok are people inside of a crowded theater. And their speech, when they speak, it travels through the air and that regulators can capture it or platforms can suppress it or censor it. When in fact, this is an entirely new paradigm where people's voice is both suppressed and amplified entirely by the decisions, not even made by individual human beings, but by software. Software driven increasingly by the goals of the algorithms, the objective function, right. which again, is very relevant to the world of artificial intelligence. And it seems to me, this is actually a very specific question that I've been sort of asking and haven't gotten a clear answer in general. I don't mean today, I mean <laughs> before today's conversation. Isn't there an opportunity here, and let's again, let's just focus on social media. Isn't there an opportunity here to have regular, you talk about behavioral expectations, to have a set of expectations around what the output is, not that it, it aligns along political lines, but for example, right now, the goal of social media platforms, what are the main goals? Again, these are complex algorithms, but one of the sort of foundational goals is engagement. You want to engage people, you want to keep them on the platform so that you can monetize them through advertising. That has produced a lot of negative externalities. 
Isn't there an opportunity here for regulation to try to focus on what those high overarching goals are, not just transparency, which I think is very important, transparency of the algorithm, which everyone should be able to agree on, but also the objective functions of the platforms, which yes, I grant could get in the way of what's optimal for profit making, but it seems to me that we're at a place of public crisis when it comes to the way in which we're increasingly living our lives, because it used to be, again, I'm now going to a soliloquy again, but I don't want to. It used to be that you used to go on the internet. You know, you used to literally go on your computer and go on the internet. That's not the case anymore. Increasingly, people's minds are spent online and it has a downstream impact on everything, on people's family lives, on policy choices, on our politics, on the cacophony. So I feel like we're really at a place of public crisis. That we're really divided on public trust so that, again, many people on the right side of the ideological spectrum don't trust regulators because they think that regulation of social media means we're going to censor conservative voices. So it goes back to my point, like when we have, you know, we had Glass-Steagall, that was very high level regulations of the financial industry, separating commercial from investment right. banking. Can't we do something similar with social media? Should we? Yes. Should we or should we not? Tell me. Yes. I mean, I'm curious. And I try and lay out an approach for that in TechLash. But let's go back into the Gilded Age. And you remember I when I went through my litany of what are the things that are similar between today's digital Gilded Age and the original Gilded Age? I ended with fake news. I just want to point out, though, that's going to trigger a lot of people. The reality is that a lot of people, again, and I'm not saying you don't recognize this, but I feel, and I got to hammer this because I get so much mail after I do episodes like this from people that think they are so, I understand where they where it comes from because a lot of the moderators and a lot of the stuff that's come out of the uh, Twitter files and stuff like this shows that a lot of stuff that we now subsequently know to be true was censored. And so when a lot of people hear fake news, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but immediately they go to their head and say, oh, so the regulators want to decide what's true or not. I just wanted to emphasize that because what I'm trying to get at in this conversation is also to say, I feel like we can produce more epistemically valid information without having to micromanage what's true and what's not true by simply trying to target the objective function of these platforms so that they produce better quality information irrespective of its political outcomes. So let's go back to that history. William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer were press barons who utilized the enrage to engage approach that you were just talking about a minute ago that is typical of social media to get as many people reading their newspapers as possible so that they could sell advertisers to reach those. My goodness, that sounds like a business model that we see today online. And what Pulitzer and Hearst did was literally, Dimitri, invent news, publish fake stories knowingly. And in 1922, the newspaper editors said, wait a minute, Let's get together and let's organize. Everybody was organizing, right, to deal with the power of big corporate entities. And they created the American Society of Newspaper Editors. And in 1923, they came out with the Code of Conduct for newspapers. The first item, tell the truth. Now, what's interesting here is that these were individuals with a conscience who had made a decision to literally bite the hand that feeds them, saying there is integrity and truth that needs to be a priority here. Today, these editorial decisions, as you point out, are made by software that is without a conscience. So the question becomes, how do we come up with the kind of code like those newspaper editors came up with that everybody signs off on? And the job of government isn't to pick and choose. I agree with that. I disagree with that. 
But the job of government is to say, how do we create a behavioral construct that is developed by everybody, what is called a multi-stakeholder approach, where you've got everybody involved in the process to create a code that everybody agrees to adhere to. And if they don't, there are enforceable consequences. And there is an analogy for that. All of the digital platform companies build their capabilities around technical standards that have been developed by this kind of multi-stakeholder approach. Because they're doing the duty of care for their own benefit. They're saying, well, wait a minute. What are the potential adverse consequences Mm. of the fact that our computers can't talk to each other or that the equipment that plugs don't work or whatever? And how do we mitigate those? So when they are acting as consumers, they say, hey, we can develop this kind of code. But when they turn around and offer services to consumers, they say, oh, we can't have a code. We just know we'll make those decisions ourselves. And those decisions, for instance, lead to what Mark Zuckerberg did in 2010 when he unilaterally announced privacy is no longer a social norm, quote unquote. Except he buys five houses around his so that he has full privacy. Privacy for them, but not for us. But the point of the matter is, who died and made Mark King? The market. And it was a decision that (laughs) was unilaterally made, absent some kind of a, what is the definition of behavioral responsibility structure? And so what we need to do to deal with this is to say, okay, the same kind of duty of care that you insist when you are a consumer, you insist on when you are a consumer, you also have to be making available when you are offering things to consumers. Behavioral standards, behavioral codes. And there is only one entity that can bring these powerful economic entities to the table to do this, and that's the government. Mm. So, I mean, I love that you brought up privacy, actually, because in my mind, and you do this in the book, you talk about privacy and I don't know if you use the word freedom, but I can't remember what it is, the, what the analogous word you use in the, in the book is. But for me, it's private. I think for most people, it's privacy, which in some ways, it's so interesting. It doesn't seem to be part of the public conversation today the way it used to be. What seems to be much more in the public conversation today is freedom of speech. And I think that's also very important. And freedom in general, not just freedom of speech, but I think as we spend more and more time on these platforms that have access to so much data and merge that ability to modify behavior with scientific insights about people's behavior, we increasingly lose freedom over our minds and over our agency. And I think this is ultimately what's at stake here. I want to move us into the second hour of the conversation, Tom, where maybe at the very beginning, I would like to ask you, in your view, what is at stake here? What is the important public interest issue today, in your view? How would you express it in a way that's comparable to what it was in the industrial era? And then what are some of the regulatory measures we can take for social media, for AI that you write in the book? Also, another thing that I wanted to ask you about is, you know, how does the great power competition between the US and China influence the decision making that's made on the AI front in terms of safety versus innovation? Because this is a thing that's come up. In fact, I think one of the board members or one of the investors in OpenAI wrote a letter after Sam Altman was initially fired. He's been since rehired saying that uh, we can't afford to slow down on this because of the competition with China. So those are just some of the things that I want to talk to you about in the second hour. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Tom Wheeler, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, 
which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Tom, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.